And now I'm excited to introduce Greg Hanch, the Executive Director of the National Alliance on Mental Illness Texas, or NAMI Texas. Greg is a master's level social worker and the recipient of NAMI's Richard T. Greer Advocacy Award for his outstanding work in leadership and service on behalf of all people living with mental illness. Greg and I are going to have a fireside chat. Thank you for joining us today, Greg. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Great. Can you um, give us an overview of NAMI first so that everybody in the audience knows what we're referencing? Absolutely, yeah. So NAMI quite simply provides an answer to the question, where do I turn to when mental illness shows up in my life or in my loved one's life? Um, we are here to listen, to support, to educate, to advise. We're someone you can talk to. NAMI has been around since the 1970s. It was founded by the NAMI Mommies in Wisconsin, a group of mothers who came together and said, the system is failing my adult children with serious mental health conditions. And since then, NAMI has expanded across the country with hundreds of, of chapters, over 600 chapters, um, 25 of them here in Texas. And we really do four or five, I would say, key things. We advocate um, shaping public policy, and that's been the area that I've focused the most on in my time at, at the Texas legislature and other places. Um, we provide support groups to family members and to individuals. The support groups are free of charge. Um, we provide education programs to a variety of audiences, primarily family members and individuals with mental health conditions, with an increasing focus on young people. Uh, and I'll talk about some of those programs a little later. We are also here, fourth purpose is to listen. We have a helpline uh, on the national level and also um, on the state level, and many of the local NAMIs have numbers that you can call to get guidance, to get advice, and get resources. And then we are here to kind of lead and shape the conversation around mental health, trying to raise broad public awareness about the impact of mental health conditions and trying to eradicate the stigma or discrimination that has been so pervasive around mental illness for so many years. So that's kind of the broad overarching overview of, of what NAMI is. Many of the programs um, are available across the state of Texas. They're all free of charge and we, we have a lot of volunteer involvement and a lot of opportunities to get involved. So I would say especially if you are a family member or an individual with a mental health condition, we, we are the place for you to connect and become engaged on mental health support, education, and advocacy. And then if you are a mental health professional, we, we have a lot of ways to, to get in, engaged as well. So definitely check us out and, and, and see how you can plug into the work that we're doing. I love that, thank you. From NAMI's perspective, what's being done both nationally and here in Texas uh, from a policy standpoint for this population? Not enough. Not enough, first and foremost. Um, I'm very encouraged, encouraged by the work that Nexus is doing. I, I hadn't heard of Nexus until quite recently, and you know, our office is now referring people to Nexus because I think the work that you all are doing um, is, is not really occurring, broadly speaking, across the healthcare system, and it's very unique, I think, the work that Nexus is doing to support uh, medically complex children um, with, who have mental health needs. Um, on, you know, I would say, you know, just to, to kind of summarize a lot of the conversation from earlier today, it's pretty obvious that historically healthcare systems have treated mental health separately from other health needs. Um, the conventional wisdom has been that children go to a mental health specialist one week and then they go to a, a non-mental health provider the next week. Or for a child with acute needs, they either check in at a non-mental health facility or they check in at a residential treatment center for their mental health. These families have to choose which need is more pressing, the mental health need or the non-mental health need. And that is an unfortunate reality that is slowly but surely changing. We get calls like that from family members um, and there are no easy answers. But circumstances are getting better, I would say, for that population. Um, I'll give a few examples. Every single local mental health authority in the state of Texas, all 39 of them, 
are now certified as Certified Behavioral Health Clinics, or CCBHCs. I won't go into a lot of depth about the CCBHC model, except to say that it notably aims to treat the whole person through access to integrated, evidence-based mental health and substance use service and primary care screenings. I would note, though, that that's on the community level. That's not for people with, with, with acute intensive needs. It's not inpatient care. But it's a, it's a big improvement that has just uh, started to unfold over the last five to 10 years um, in Texas, and we're very encouraged by it. Another promising development is the collaborative care model that ha has started to become uh, available in Texas. Um, the collaborative care model is a systematic approach to the treatment of behavioral health conditions in primary care settings. The model integrates the services of behavioral health care managers and consulting psychiatrists with primary care providers who provide oversight to proactively manage behavioral health conditions as chronic diseases rather than treating acute symptoms. So the short version of that is mental illness is most commonly identified in the primary care setting. But do primary care providers have the training and the bandwidth to provide robust mental health care to people who may be struggling with anxiety, depression, or another mental health condition. Generally speaking, no. The primary care provider is saying, there's a psychiatrist on the other side of town. Here's their business card. Why don't you schedule an appointment with them? Well, what happens then? The person often doesn't follow up with the primary care or with the, the psychiatrist. Um, they, they get lost in the bureaucracy of the healthcare system. So, if we can provide some level of mental health services on site in the primary care office, it's, it, it results in, improve, in an improvement. It's largely effective for, pe for people with mild or moderate mental health conditions. Again, this is on the community level. This is not robust, intensive, perhaps inpatient care, but it's a big step in the right direction. The last thing I wanted to mention before we talk about some gaps is the YES waiver, which is on the community level. It's for children with serious emotional disturbances. It's at the local mental health authorities. It's wraparound services. And it, it, it largely exists to keep children from needing a residential treatment center or a psychiatric hospital. And it's, it's effective at keeping kids out of, out of uh, you know, the, the more intensive setting, uh, the more expensive intensive setting. The problem is with the YES waiver is it's, it, there are long wait lists for access to those intensive wraparound services. Um, and as I'll get into, we don't have the workforce capacity to really bring services like the YES waiver to scale across the state. And finally, the YES waiver is only for Medicaid kids. And so, you know, the, the, the level of access, regardless of, uh, regardless of insurance status, just isn't there. Well, le which leads me to... Um you know, talking about some of those gaps in services. So the, 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 the <clears throat> most, I think, talked about issue in the most recent legislative session in Texas it, when it comes to mental health is the mental health workforce shortages that, that are so pervasive in our state. Texas has the worst mental health workforce shortages in the nation. Every, virtually every county in the state of Texas Ha, it, it is officially designated as a whole or partial mental health workforce shortage area. So how are we going to expand access to specialized therapies and treatments if we don't have the providers that we need to, 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 to set those programs up? So, you know, there, there are some efforts being made to address that issue. It's going to take a long time, you know, to get us to the supply that we need to have. And, and I think it is reasonable to say we will never have enough mental health professionals, you know, in, in our state. It's just the reality. But we can, we can close that gap. And it's worth noting that there is a student loan repayment assistance program for mental health professionals. People who going to school in Texas to become a mental health professional can potentially have their loans repaid by the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. So we're, we're heading in the right direction. Workforce is a big gap, though. It's the biggest one. The, secondly, the demand for services is rising. And that is, is due to a, a several factors, one of which is just the, the population growth that we see in our state. 
and, and the other is, is just that, you know, there's an explosion in the need for mental health services over the last four or five years for both children and adults. And I think COVID is, you know, probably the, 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 the reason that, you know, that gets identified the most for that. But, you know, just to put some numbers behind that, um, Texas Children's Hospital here in Houston has experienced an 800% increase in mental health services since the pandemic began. Currently, 400 to, uh, 400 to 450 children and adolescents are showing up at Texas Children's Emergency Centers monthly for help with the behavioral health crisis. Prior to the pandemic, it was 50 children per month. So, you know, the, the gap is simply that there aren't enough services to meet that rising demand. There are some partnerships that are occurring, you know, Texas Children's Hospital and the Menninger Clinic, for example, have, uh, are building new beds for ch specifically pediatric inpatient mental health beds. And there's a, a broad investment being made on the state level um, to build new state hospitals or partner with academic medical centers to, to create in more inpatient beds. But we are well behind where we need to be in terms of inpatient, just inpatient mental health capacity. Forget about you know, the fact that the inpatient beds that are being established are not really being designed to serve the medically complex population. So, you know, those are a couple. I'm glad that it was mentioned earlier around the lack of mental health parity in our state. Dr. Canavera, fantastic job, you know, bringing that important issue up. The fact that payment and reimbursement for services is inadequate. That still, despite over 15 years of legislation on the federal level and more recently on the state level to ensure that insurance companies are being held accountable for treating mental health comparably to the way they're treating other health conditions. Despite all those efforts that are being made, insurance companies are denying mental health services at higher rates than they are other health conditions, services for other health conditions. So we have more work to do in, in, in promoting mental health parity and holding insurance companies accountable for their obligations under the law. Yes, absolutely. Um, one of my other questions that I had jotted down was what resources are available through NAMI for parents from an education and a training standpoint? Thank you for asking that. And, and, and b before I answer that, that I, I, I just want to tap tag one more thing onto my previous answer, Absolutely. which is this new CMS, you know, fe federal Medicaid and Medicare agency, uh, benefit, which is a Medicaid health home benefit for children with complex health conditions. This is a medical home for the population that, that we're talking about. Um, the new optional benefit helps state Medicaid programs provide Medicaid eligible children who have medically complex conditions with person-centered care management, care coordination, and the important and often overlooked patient and family support. Texas, from what I understand, is pursuing that new Medicaid benefit um, as of December 1st of last year. It's called the Comprehensive Health Homes for Integrated Care Kids Pilot Program. It's a bit of a mouthful, right? C-H-I-C, keep that acronym in mind. A number of the Texas Medicaid managed care organizations are implementing this new benefit as a pilot project. Aetna, Amerigroup, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Community First, Cook Children's, Driscoll, United Healthcare. Th that service is potentially available to kids. An incredible Medicaid health home care coordination benefit for that medically complex population. To answer your question, as far as NAMI goes, um, that is one of our core focuses is providing education and training to families and to individuals. I think for this population, parents and caregivers of children and adolescents, our, our, our most known program and, and most effective program is the NAMI Basics program, which is a six week, uh, six session education program for parents and caregivers of people under the age of 22. It's free to participants. 99% of participants say they would recommend the program to others. What will you learn in a NAMI basics class? A parent or caregiver will learn the impact that mental health conditions can have on the entire family, the different types of mental health care professionals, an overview of the public mental health care system, school and juvenile justice systems, how to advocate for a child's rights at school, how to prepare for and respond to crisis situations, 
and, and much more. The bottom line here is, is, is that where else are parents and caregivers going to get this information when their child starts to experience a, a psychiatric crisis? We know that half of mental health conditions emerge before the age of 14, 75% before the age of 24. Did a parent or caregiver learn this information in school 20 years ago? Probably not. So we are the place to turn to to provide that support. And what's unique about that NAMI Basics program is it's available on demand. So a, a, a child, let's say a 16-year-old child has a, 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 a psychotic episode. A parent or caregiver that day can log on to the NAMI Basics webpage and, and soak in this curriculum. And I should mention before the, your next question is, what I think what really separates programs like NAMI Basics and, and the other NAMI programs apart from other types of mental health services is that we're putting lived experience front and center. That's the, that's the special sauce, that's the magic ingredient. You know, and we've talked a lot about today, for good reason, um, about the role of psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers and counselors um, who are highly trained and provide very effective services. But what we're missing, I think, in that conversation is leveraging lived experience. Parents need someone to connect to. They need someone who speaks their language. They need to, they need to be able to, to learn from someone who has been through a similar experience. And, and, and that is a big focus of what, what NAMI is doing. Um, and other, other providers also have recognized the importance of leveraging lived experience. I'll give one example. The Certified Family Partner Program in Texas and in other places. These are, these are trained family members of, of parent, uh, parents and caregivers of children and adolescents who work at places like local mental health authorities. They're employed by the local mental health authority to help parents and caregivers of, of children who are struggling navigate the system and walk hand in hand with them through accessing resources, navigating these, these complex challenges. Yes, and that's powerful. That and the peer support, I think you really um, speak to what we have seen is very valuable. Um, I, for all of us in the audience, I think having you here and learning more about NAMI, um, how do we help support and collaborate with NAMI? I think that would be, you know, continuing this conversation into the future. So if you could tell us a little about that. that Absolutely. Yeah. So um, NAMI is largely, uh, our programs are largely run by volunteers. So, you know, most people in this room, I would venture to say, have a mental health condition or have a loved one with a mental health condition. Everyone knows someone who has been affected, I, I, I think is a reasonable hypothesis. One in four adults live with a mental health condition, one in six children. So, you know, that's the, the best way to get involved is, is to use your lived experience to support others. And, and, and we, we remind people that there's a therapeutic value in service to others. And, and, and so get involved. If you feel passionate about supporting families through perhaps struggles that your family has been through, then, then get involved. That's, that's why I joined NAMI um, over 10 years ago was because my family was failed by the mental health system. And so I wanted to, to be there for, for other families and not you know, have to see other families go through what we went through. Um, we also have our annual conference coming up right here in Houston. Uh, Nexus will be there uh, two weeks from today in the Galleria, so um, check that out. We have workshops, we have continuing education for uh, mental health professionals, and, and just a, a great way, you know, it's a great way for uh, family members to learn from each other, to learn from mental health professionals. Join NAMI, become a member, we're a membership organization. We rely on the support of donors. Um, there are many ways for, for people to get involved and get plugged into the work that NAMI's doing. That's excellent. We are looking forward to your conference next month and, and supporting that. Um, we are going to wrap up. Does anybody have any questions for Greg?
permitting people to be able to say, it's okay. It's okay. There is help, and you guys have done it. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate that. You know, and that is a big focus, reminding people that the brain is part of the body, um, that there's no shame in experiencing a mental health condition. There's no shame in experiencing any health condition. And, and you know, so our role is, is in large part to bring mental illness out of the shadows and get people talking about it. And why, why do we want to do that? One, because it helps for people to get things off their chest. It helps the individual. But it also, um, it, it, it also is heard by others who may be suffering in silence. And as a result of suffering in silence, they're not accessing the services and supports that they need. So one of our programs is NAMI In Our Own Voice, which is public speaking by people who have lived experience. It's reaching thousands of people and, 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 and reminding people that it's okay to not be okay and recovery is possible and help is available. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time today and being here with us. It's really been enlightening. Thank you so much. Thank you.